today. You might uh, be wondering what this is all about up on the screen there. Um, can you see a bit of a dichotomy in that uh, image on the screen there? Uh, God rules and it's all done in graffiti. Probably one of the most uh, obvious things which is anti-rules. You know, graphic graffiti artists, they love to just sort of get out there and defy society and make their, put their tags and so forth out there. But um, this is one of the challenges we face in modern society, isn't it? That uh, they're very much anti-rule, anti-establishment, anti-authoritarianism. And that's why the church struggles to, to uh, find people who are willing to actually trust God to, to make the rules and uh, make rules that uh, are actually for our own, our own benefit. Notice this uh, next slide. I'll let you digest it for a few moments uh, and see what it's actually saying there. So the one guy there has decided that uh, he doesn't like rules and uh, he feels he's confined by this fence. And of course his friend's saying, no, it's not a fence, it's actually a guardrail. And um, sadly this is uh, some of what we see, not only in society but even in the church today. People feel constrained, confined and restricted. They want freedom just to do what they want to do. And uh, there's a perception that uh, God's rules if you like, uh, restricting their freedom and their happiness. Nothing new about that. This was the attitude of Lucifer and the fallen angels. All, they all felt that God's rules were constraining them. They were higher beings. They were moral beings. They could make up their own rules. They didn't need to be told what to do. I remember in my college days, um, in, we studied some psychology there, and they, I think it's called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. It's a humanistic sort of approach to um, human development mental and moral and uh, development. And, um, of course, at the very bottom of that pyramid they have just to describe it or to illustrate that, it's the basic uh, young people, the children, that, that need to be told by some external rule as to how they ought to live. But with this model, the idea is that as we develop and evolve, if you like, into more higher, higher moral, ethical state, we don't need the rules anymore. We can make our own rules. But that's not, what, that's not really the way it is. The human condition, God understands, and we need to learn to understand, is that we need this external rule to help us know and how to govern and protect us from our own human foolishness. And we may not like to actually dwell on that for too long, but that's the reality, isn't it? You know, we need God to show us uh, right from wrong and to teach us. And we can thank him not only for these rules we're going to talk about today, but also for the the indwelling spirit which speaks to our heart and guides us and teaches us right from wrong and convicts us of where we ought to be going, what we ought to be doing and what we ought not to be doing. So I've got a, um, a thing that uh, I was given quite a number of years ago. I think it was probably 2004. It's, it's, I've seen it around on the, um, on the internet in recent times as well. There's 10 points here and it's, uh, it's a, I mean, you could say it's a light-hearted look or you could also say it's a blasphemous look and uh, an attack on God's laws. And I'll just share one or two samples because it's, uh, it's quite a lengthy document. Um, just for example, they say, um, Leviticus 25, 44 states that I may indeed possess slaves, both male and female, provided that they are purchased from a neighbouring nation. A friend of mine claims that this applies to Mexicans but not to Canadians. Can you clarify for me? Why can't I own Canadians? And so it's like I say, it's sort of a light-hearted look on the one hand, but when, I mean, I could, if I read this on the internet from a, a stranger, I would probably get a laugh out of it. But this was actually handed to me by one of my church members. And that's, they're, it's, what they're doing is they're mocking and ridiculing the Word of God and the rules that God has put in place for our good. Now, some of these rules, of course, don't apply whatsoever to us today. And um, what I've done, in fact, is to go through these 10 points years ago and I gave my response to each of them on a in a serious note and I gave it back to her and I told her, this is what you, there's my response to this document that you gave me lightheartedly or, in my view, for a Christian to do that and make a mockery of God's rules is, is not very appropriate. Um, I'll give another one more example here. A friend of mine feels that although it is an abomination to eat shellfish, it is a lesser abomination than homosexuality. I don't agree. Can you settle this? You know, what's worse, homosexuality or eating shellfish? And so it's just this mocking and ridiculing of the rules that God has put in place 
and defy, I think to me it's defiance of what God has. And it's not, there's no sincere or honest attempt to try and understand what, the, what these rules and laws really mean and how they would apply to us today or if they apply at all. And so I want to uh, focus on that um, as we go through the uh, presentation today, what some of those things really mean, how they apply and if, if they apply at all. So um, because some of these, um, there's, there's this sort of basic misunderstanding amongst some people about how God's Ten Commandments apply, I want to look at some of the attitudes that people have, uh, have, have demonstrated regarding the Ten Commandments. And you'll be familiar with some of these points that people have made. Some say that the Ten Commandment law has been done away with or abolished. And uh, anybody who's been out studying with, uh, with uh, evangelical Christians will be challenged by some of these ways that they say that they don't want to keep the law. And it's particularly, of course, because of the Sabbath issue. They're quite happy to accept the nine commandments, but the, the fourth one is actually quite a problem for them. So they argue that the law has been done away with or it's been abolished. Or they might say, for example, oh, well, the Ten Commandment law really only applies for the Jews. It's not for all of us, human. it's Christians or anyone else, it's just for the Jews. It's a Jewish law. And so they, they try and diminish its, uh, its uh, power by saying that. Or they might say Jesus fulfilled the law. When he came to this world, he even said himself, he didn't come to destroy the law, he came, he came to fulfil it. And so in fulfilling it, it's no longer binding upon us as, as Christians, as Jesus followers. He's done it all for us. And it's a bit like the cheap grace idea where we just have to uh, love Jesus and accept him as our saviour and he's done it all before. It's all been done by him, completed at the cross. We just simply go and sing a few songs of praise and thank God and get on with our lives the way, whatever way we may want to without the constraints of a law uh, telling us how to live our lives, particularly what to do with that seventh day each week. They might say that um, the Ten Commandment law has been superseded by the law of love. Just love God and love your fellow man. That's all we're required to do. Don't get into all the detail and prescribe for me how I ought to live. We don't need that. We are now, that law has been superseded by the law of love. And uh, that's, that's all very nice sounding also. Or they might say it's been nailed to the cross. You know, they can pull a Bible verse out of Colossians there and say, look, see, there it is. Even the Sabbath is mentioned. The Sabbaths have been nailed to the cross. And they'll argue that point that it's all been completed. It's all been done away with. Jesus did it all for us. It's no longer binding upon us. And then finally, they might say, and, and perhaps rightly so, that the law has been written upon our hearts. Uh, as it says in Hebrews chapter 10 and, and other places also, that the Lord promised to write his law upon our hearts. And praise God, that's what he intends to do, what he wants to do, and he is doing if we will cooperate with him. But nonetheless, that does not in any way diminish the, the force of the Ten Commandments as God gave them uh, in stone. As the, we see this image here, they're being uh, crushed and, and trampled upon. So having the law written upon our heart, having them internalised, is a bit like that, uh, the pinnacle of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Once we get to that place where we have God's law written upon our hearts, well, perhaps we don't need to read our Bibles and uh, dig out every week what the actual Ten Commandments tell us because we've so fallen in love with God, we so appreciate and value His law that we've, that we've internalised them. They've become a part of us. We do love God supremely. We do love our fellow man because of the indwelling spirit has transformed us to the state where God's law is, is really just a part of who we are now. But that, again, it doesn't in any way at all uh, nullify or detract from what the Ten Commandments as they're spelled out. And, and by the way, beyond the Ten Commandments uh, also, there are many other principles that we can find in the Scriptures that God wants us to live by that will be wholesome and healthy and uh, make us better people and make society a better place to, to live in. So I've got a, a second handout here, or not a handout actually, but just an, uh, an, an appendix if you like. Um, we'll look at the various uh, laws. Now this, this particular sheet only deals with a, a comparison between the moral law or the Ten Commandments and on the other hand the ceremonial laws that, were, that governed the, the religious calendar of the Jews. You know, they had seven festivals each year, you know, the Day of Atonement, the Day of Trumpets, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Pentecost, etc. They had their seven feasts. And of course, they had this whole sanctuary service was governed by the ceremonial laws. They're all um, given by God to Moses and written down in a book. All the details of how the sanctuary was to be built, the clothes that were to be worn, how the services were to be carried out, 
all the various guidelines and, uh, and so forth were given there. So this, this particular sheet deals with the moral law as it compares or contrasts with the ceremonial law. But just before I go to that, there's also other laws that just worth, are worth mentioning. And they are things like perhaps the civil law or the health laws or perhaps laws regarding quarantine or hygiene, which we would, uh, I, I think, happily embrace today. They're not something that was a part of the ceremonial law and therefore done away with at, at the cross, as the ceremonial law was. So just for example, um, health laws... You know, um, we as a church believe very strongly that um, God wants us to treat our bodies as the temple of the Holy Spirit and uh, live the optimum lifestyle, the healthiest lifestyle we can in our context here. And that would uh, perhaps mean going to a largely plant-based diet. And of course, some are able to go to a complete uh, plant-based diet, become vegans. But uh, beyond just diet, there's all sorts of other health things that we can uh, factor into how we live our lives that, in a way that will honour God. Isn't that so? Yeah, God wants us to live in a way that will honour him. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's a principle that God has outlined for us. But some of the Old Testament uh, details in, in, um, in, in quite clear uh, terms, certain foods or certain things that we ought not eat. Isn't that so? And those, those are health principles that are, that are eternal. They're not just for the Jews. They're not part of the ceremonial law. They are health principles that God has given to us to protect us from negative consequences, if you like. And if you can go back very, very easily to the book of Genesis, to the creation account, and what did God give to Adam and Eve to eat? Fruits, nuts, grains and seeds, I think. That's it. And then, of course, uh, after the um, introduction of sin, vegetables were also allowed to be eaten. And then at the time of Noah's flood, clean meat was also included in diet that was to be no fat and no blood, basically what a Jew would consider kosher, clean meat. Not those unclean foods such as pork, shellfish, etc. I think we're all fairly, most of us would have a fairly clear understanding of what those health principles and laws are. But the point is they are still applicable to us today, to all people. If we, if we love God and want to honour him, we would choose to follow the lifestyle he has given to us. And, and likewise with um, hygiene laws. You know, God in his wisdom introduced those hygiene laws, quarantine laws and so forth. You can imagine perhaps up to two million people travelling from Egypt to the Promised Land, living in close quarters in tents, no, no sort of underground sewage system in place. And uh, there was the knee and burying the dead and uh, disposing of animal carcasses in the sanctuary and in their, in their very regular consumption. I mean, they, they needed to be very careful about the spread of disease, didn't they? And God, in his wisdom, gave them uh, hygiene laws that are very much applicable today. And in modern societies, we're able to, because of the, 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 the countries we mostly live in and come from, uh, are privileged to live in a place where we can observe hygiene um, principles quite easily and to our own benefit. Now, I tempted to be a little bit controversial and mention the whole thing about whether or not we should vaccinate our children. But uh, it's a, such a hot topic today. Um, I, I've uh, been engaged in discussions on the internet and, uh, and had my knuckles wrapped because I, I put, dared to put my opinion out there. But, um, you know, God in his wisdom has given us laws like such as that, health laws, hygiene laws and civil laws even. And uh, we would be foolish to just ignore civil laws, wouldn't we? Now, I'm not, I'm not a, um, a saint in one sense. I am a saint in, in a biblical sense. But I've, I've got a very, very bad um, record in terms of my driving on the road with traffic regulations and so on. And I'm happy to say that that's mostly in my past. Since I became a Christian, I've, I've become a bit more sensible and uh, I've only sort of inadvertently done something like use my phone while I'm driving and, um, and paid the penalty because I got caught. But those rules are very sensible rules, aren't they? For our own good, for the good of society. And we're we're really being... uh, It's not good for us to do that sort of thing, is it? It's foolish and dangerous, in fact. Um, In fact, I can say just now, because they're not here, my wife and daughter had a fight this morning because um, my daughter wanted to use her maps function on her phone to come to coming in today, and she got in trouble off her mum for doing it while she was driving. And so, you know, but we really need to be cautious about following 
the laws of the land. I mean, that's, that's just the sensible thing to do in large part. There may be some things that ultimately we will face that conflict with God's laws. And then, of course, we'll need to make a choice. What's more important to us, obeying the laws of the land or obeying the law of God? But that's not our concern today. But there, there may be a coming time when that does happen to us. So just going back uh, to the um, um, book of Exodus where God gave to Moses. Now, you remember the story, of course. They've been in Egyptian slavery for over 400 years. They've been delivered in a miraculous way uh, from the Egyptian bondage. They've now found their way to the base of Mount Sinai. God here then uh, uh, spoke to Moses. Uh, he said, when the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the testimony, uh, the tables of stone inscribed by the finger of God. Now, I don't think we're, we're drawing a long bow by suggesting that the fact that God wrote it with his very finger on tables of stone has some significance, doesn't it? What does it say? I mean, these are important, aren't they? God himself went to the trouble of actually inscribing them with his own finger. And um, not only that, but they're, in, they're engraved in stone for a reason, aren't they? They're not just some disposable item. These are in rock. You know, these are intent to be permanent. And um, you know, when you contrast that with this um, other sheet I was going to show you, the ceremonial laws were written in a book, whether it be parchment or vellum or paper, I don't know, uh, papyrus. I'm not too sure exactly what Moses had at his, his disposal, but the point being that they were not permanent as the stone laws were. And um, for example here, I've just highlighted a few here. God spoke the Ten Commandment laws. Moses, or sorry, they were given to Moses to speak to the people. So God didn't speak all of these ceremonial laws to the people. Moses did so. Uh, the, the, the moral law was written by God's finger. Moses wrote the ceremonial law in a book. Uh, the, the moral law, the Ten Commandment law, originated or existed before sin, whereas the, give, the, uh, the ceremonial laws were given after sin came in. Um, down to earth for the bottom, God's moral law is eternal. It's established. It's an eternal principle-based law. And the ceremonial laws were temporary. They were only... They were abolished at the cross. The whole ceremonial system had come to its end. It had served its purpose. They no longer were valid or relevant. We now lived in a, new, in a whole new era. Um, the moral law is described as, not, as being a delight and not grievous to us. They're, they should be a delight and a pleasure for us to observe, whereas the other one was contrary to us. It was against us. And then finally, um, Christ magnified the moral law, the Ten Commandment law, whereas he abolished the ceremonial law. That's the one he did away with. It was nailed to the cross. And so those laws, are they're clearly distinct. The moral law is one that was written by God's finger in stone. The other laws were, uh, the ceremonial laws particularly, written in paper and were temporary in nature. The other ones, I think we need to rely on a bit of common sense. The health laws, for example, the civil laws, or the, um, what was the other one? The, the, the hygiene laws. We exercise a little bit of common sense and we'll soon realise as we apply to that, we'll, we'll realise that they are still relevant. We can apply important principles to ourselves today. So even though it was um, around, say, 1440 BC when God gave these to Moses at Mount Sinai, there's a very clear biblical um, uh, evidence that these laws applied beforehand. In fact, you can go right back to the very beginning of the, um, the Bible account and see that the moral law, the Ten Commandment law, applied right from the very beginning, didn't it? Now, it may not have been uh, explicitly stated until after sin came in, but it's very clearly my conviction that the moral law has existed throughout eternity. It may have been applied to our circumstances here on earth. For example, the Sabbath. I mean, is there going to be a, has there always been a Sabbath kept in the universe, uh, in heaven? Considering, for example, that it is a, it is a memorial of... God's work of creation. Six days God did it and then he rested on the Sabbath and established that as a memorial of what he had done. But nonetheless, the principles remain. They are, they are eternal principles. Um, and so you could look, there's a, there's a chart here and I'm happy to produce some of these. I'll give them to Harut on his resource table. Uh, they're not today, but I'll, I'll put them there as a resource if you want a, a copy of these sort of charts. And um, on the first column over here, it, it lists um, how the law applied, the moral law applied 
from the time of Eden through until the time of Mount Sinai. There's three and a half thousand years of Earth's history. That's if you accept the fact that, uh, or if you accept the view that the Earth is 6,000 years old, of course. Um, so there's a three and a half thousand year period where the Bible does point out and illustrate where these ten laws were actually, um, you can find them there in the scripture. And they're all, all the references are found there for you, each of the ten commandments. And likewise, the idea that the law has been done away with or abolished or fulfilled by Jesus is a nonsense also because you see here evidence in the New Testament of how the Ten Commandment law still applies from that point forward. And so there's no doubt any, any uh, um, semi-serious uh, Bible student can find out for themselves that the Ten Commandment law is not something that was applied for the Jews. It wasn't given at uh, Mount Sinai at all. It was, it, was, it was put in writing, but it was always there. Now, what kind of law do you think Adam and Eve lived under before they sinned? Do you think that perhaps the law was written upon their hearts, just like God intends it to be done for his people to, as, as time goes along? Yeah. I'm sure that's the case. The law was on their hearts. It was a part of how God made them, of course. Now, tragically, they turned their back on that and they, and they betrayed their, their tr their God's trust in them. But nonetheless, the law was in their heart. They knew right from wrong. They just simply knew that. They were moral beings. And um, so as time went on, of course, uh, pre-writing, oral tradition was the norm, wasn't it? Father passed on to son. And the clans, I mean, you imagine Abraham with his tribe and his people, servants and family and so forth. I can imagine them sitting around the tents and the fires at night, passing on the story, sharing. And they, they memorised massive portions of these uh, accounts of the creation and the story of that family. I mean, you think of the family of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and the 12 sons and, and on the story goes, doesn't it? We've just been looking at it last night at Care Group, the story of Joseph and his interaction with Pharaoh. And it's a tremendous story, but this is God's people. Uh, the story t told over and over again throughout generations. And then ultimately, of course, God revealed that story to Moses and Moses wrote it all down for, for, for perpetuity. We have it in our Bible still today. That's an amazing thing. But of course, throughout those long ages of Earth's history, it was just passed down, word of mouth. And uh, you find that even in in, if you like, modern-day primal cultures like the Aboriginal people of Australia, oral tradition has played a very important part in their, in their culture and their, their, their identity, who they are as a people. And so um, the moral law, of, car, of course, was something that they were all familiar with. Now, let me also say that their time in Egypt made it quite a challenge for them, though, in slavery for, for long periods of time. You think Australia's history is only a couple of hundred years long, they were in there for three, four hundred years as slaves. And of course, uh, that, a lot of that was largely lost. And you can see that on their journey from, from, um, from Egypt to Mount Sinai to the Promised Land. They were, they were stubborn. They were stiff-necked. They wanted it back the old ways. You know, they were used to this kind of life. You know? They wanted the, the flesh pots and the quail and they wanted to do things their way. But God had a better way, didn't he? You know, he had the perfect food for them. Their sandals didn't wear out. They didn't get sick, you know. God was there with them, wasn't he? But they were stubborn. And just like we are today, we sometimes resist doing what God wants us to do. But we, we need to learn to submit, don't we? And do what God has told us is the right thing for our own good. That's what the law is about. It's not there as a burden and to curse us and, and constrain us from enjoying life. Of course he wants us to enjoy life. But the laws are there for our good whether they be hygiene laws, health laws, civil laws or moral law, they are there for our good. And praise God for that. You know, as, as families, as parents, you know, we're not going to let our children grow up in a, in a household of chaos, are we, or anarchy? We need to put constraints on them, don't we? I mean, I, I grew up in a neighbourhood where it was uh, housing commission, fibro and uh, an alcoholic father that was never there. And mum raising five children, working a full-time job, you know, feeding, washing, ironing, cooking, cleaning, the whole lot. We kids were out in the street having fun. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't um, a breakdown of society's order. There were constraints in place still. But there was, there's, sadly, today, it's not the same. You can't just let your kids go out and play on the streets like we could. And some of you could remember doing the same kinds of things. But there's always has been, there always needs to be some constraints on 
our human behaviour, our interaction in society, whether they be villages or cities or nations or families, no matter what it is. And of course, most importantly, constraints upon our own personal behaviours and attitudes. You know, we, we really need to be um, under God's lordship. And uh, I mean, there's the, there's the starting principle, isn't it? That's the starting point. Submitting to God as our Lord and Saviour, allowing him to be the Lord of our lives in, in very practical day-by-day -day ways. Allowing him to guide the decisions we make, the attitudes we cherish, the way we treat each other. And of course, you know, we, we will grow and learn as we, um, as we develop um, in our Christian experience. And we don't want to set ourselves up as, as any paragon of spiritual virtue. We're all on a journey, aren't we? And uh, whether, whether we're advanced or, or tagging along behind or new to the faith, you know, we need to be patient with one another. You know, live by setting a good example, but don't be there bashing people and telling them exactly how every detail of their life ought to be lived. But God has brought us all into, into community for a reason, to encourage each other, to pray for one another, to live out the Christian experience in our life and be a good example to other people. You know, there's, a, there's a caution there, a warning about becoming a stumbling block to, to the younger members of the faith and ensuring that we are living out a good Christian example to them. Now, let's take a risk here. Um, okay, let's, um, let's move on to my next point. Going back to this idea that the, some people have that the law was given to humanity or the Jews, if you like, at Mount Sinai and sort of ignoring the fact that the law existed right prior to that. What does that statement say? Where there is no law, there's no transgression. You know, God is not going to uh, accuse us of being guilty sinners if there's no law uh, known to us. I mean, would, imagine if you were pulled over by the policeman and he said, oh, you just went through that red light. Uh, but there's nothing actually on the statutes that says it's illegal to go through the red light. You know, that would be a nonsense, wouldn't it? We wouldn't accept that. We'd be going to court and saying, well, hang on a minute. There's nothing in the road traffic handbook that says I can't do that. Why, why are you even calling it you know, to question? You know, just this morning on the way to church, we were driving along uh, Glebe Point Road and I'm easily distracted, unfortunately, and I was probably talking to somebody. And next thing you know, there was a car in front of me and it was completely stopped at a, at a pedestrian crossing. And I had to actually go up beside it and I went up and, and stopped as quickly as I could on the crossing actually and there was a lady about to walk across but the, the car in front of me had no brake lights and I, so I had to reverse back and we just wound the window down and said look you, your brake lights aren't working and you know, almost caused a bad accident um, but it was partly my fault, I was distracted but you, know, you can imagine if there was no road rules. Um, have you ever been to um, Cambodia or <laughs> Thailand, <laughs> sorry Julie? Um, you know, these places where it's, it's just a bit of a free-for-all. Um, I've never, never been to those places. I've been to Rome and it was uh, quite an experience. But, you know, um, you know, it can be quite chaotic, can't it? And they say one in three people who go to um, Southeast Asia end up getting hurt, you know, or killed or something like that. It's quite a dangerous place. Baghdad. Uh, sorry? Baghdad. Baghdad could be even worse. Yeah, you'd have um, roadside terrorists there to, to contend with as well. But the point is that, you know, where would we be without rules and regulations and laws? You know, they're for our own benefit, aren't they? They're for our good. And God has known this. The laws of uh, his laws that he's given to mankind have always been there. They may not have been in writing, but the people were aware of them, you know, by and large. Those, of course, who chose to separate from following after God and live there. And you've got, you know, uh, Nimrod and the whole Tower of Babel and the, 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 the flood of Noah's time because people chose to ignore God's laws and do their own thing. What did they do? I mean, a complete breakdown of society. Every man did what was right in their own eyes and the place became so corrupt that God couldn't stand it anymore because they chose to ignore the laws that God had given to them and they lived in outright rebellion to God. And that's sadly where our society is heading today, isn't it? Jesus said, just like it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And as, as Christians, as followers of Christ... We have a responsibility to be beacons of light, don't we? To be morally upright in all of our dealings with our fellow citizens in the world and more, most importantly, of course, amongst ourselves. You know, treating each other with love. Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And that love has to be, of course, manifest in action. One of our young people 
and I, I'm pleading for your understanding and support here. I'm not doing this to, to in any way hurt her. But she, we, at our care group last night, she announced that she's pregnant. She's a single mum already. And she just wanted to put this out there to let us know that she's having a baby. And uh, you know what? There was a long, awkward silence. I don't really know what she's going through. But this is the fact. This is what we have to deal with. Is that she's part of our church family. And uh, despite the fact that she's made a, a, a foolish mistake... And uh, this is her situation now, isn't it? And we as a church family need to get behind her and embrace her and love her. And I was able to talk to her quietly, briefly, and said, look, you know, whatever help you think we can offer you, please ask. Let us help you. And, you know, as a church, we need to be able to do that, don't we? And I know that, that this church here uh, at the city is uh, made up of vastly diverse uh, peoples. But nonetheless, there's one thing that binds us all together, isn't there? We all love the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our, he's our brother. And uh, we want to honour him by the way we live, don't we? And particularly in this area of how we treat one another. And I'm, look, I'm, I'm happy to confess, I'm not the easiest person to get along with. As I said last week at AYC, I was pleased to see some of our folk going down the front, responding to these appeals. I went down because I have this problem with impatience. And, um, you know, I need God's help, just like we all do, with different issues we struggle with. But nonetheless, I've got an issue that I want your understanding over and your prayers for, because uh, I want to live in a way that will honour God and also will um, make you feel happy to be a part of this organisation here, this group, this family. And, um, you yeah, despite my shortcomings... I want to be a part of it too. I love being here. But uh, we all need to work under God's lordship and uh, by God's grace, he will give us victory over those things that trouble us. And I hope and pray that uh, as, a, as a family here together, we can do that. Now, I better move on. Um, so going back even further, so just after the fall of uh, Adam and Eve, of course, the story goes on quite quickly to announce the arrival of Abel and Cain, or Cain and Abel. But before long, we've got this scenario. Why are you angry? So Cain had brought along his fruit and vegetables as an offering to God. Abel had brought along his blood sacrifice, the lamb that God had asked for. And all of a sudden, Cain's angry at Abel. Why, why would he be angry at Abel? <laughs> Abel didn't do anything wrong. But nonetheless, this is what's happened with rebellion, isn't it? When you, don't, when you get out of harmony with God's ways, this is what it leads to. And so what does it say next? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Now, how would you define sin? What is sin? <coughs> the transgression of the law? The transgression of the law, lawlessness. I'm going to share in a few minutes' time some other definitions of sin, but my point is here is that if there was no law, there would be no sin, would there? Cain very well knew he'd done the wrong thing, didn't he? When he was only one generation, one generation away from that perfect creation. Uh, even though Adam and Eve had fallen and they passed on their fallenness to, to him, he was very well aware of what God's requirements were. There's no doubt about that in my mind at all. God required a blood sacrifice. He would have been told that very clearly. Giant intellects, these people, lived for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, the point is that sin was there. He killed his brother. And he knew very well what he'd done was wrong. That was the law being broken. So this, the law of God existed right throughout that era. Another example was Abraham. Abraham, it says here, obeyed God's voice, kept God's charge, kept God's commandments and all of his laws and so forth. Abraham, of course, was um, several hundred years before Mount Sinai and the giving of the Ten Commandments. So he was very well aware of what God's requirements were also. And of course, this just briefly touching on the giving of the manna. So just prior to their arrival at Mount Sinai, God's giving them manna every morning, isn't he? Six days you can collect it. On the seventh day, don't collect it. Why? Because that's my Sabbath. On Friday, you can get a double portion though, and it won't go rotten. What, a, what an amazing God. Every other day it would go rotten because that was God's way of proving them, testing them. Trust me. I know what I'm doing here. Only collect what you need every day of the week. But on Friday, collect a double portion, put it aside. And on Sabbath, you'll have fresh food to eat. I guarantee it. 
And so God instituted or reinstituted, if you like, the Sabbath. It had been forgotten throughout their sojourn in Egypt. But the law was there, wasn't it? God was, in, God was bringing it back to their attention and, and charging them to be faithful to what God required of them. It was for their own good. And it goes on to say this at the end there. And so the people did rest. If you read the whole story there in, in chapter 16, they did rest on the Sabbath. There was the occasional transgressor, but by and large, the people learnt to submit to God and trust him at that point. Now, into the New Testament here, um, it says in Romans here, for it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but who is it? It is those who obey the law who are declared righteous. Now, I thought we were declared righteous by, fa righteous by faith in what God has done for us and what God promises to us. Isn't that so? So what's this getting at then, Russell? So the obedience is evidence of our faith, our trust, uh, allowing him to be the Lord of our life. You know, I think James says something like, without, faith works, uh, without works, faith is dead. And so surely uh, faith is the foundation of our relationship with God, the way he can declare us righteous. But the works or the obedience, if you like, are an essential part of God's determination of whether we truly are his or not. You know, Jesus said... Many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we done this and thus and so? He said, I never knew you, you who work iniquity. So the evidence of our, of our trust in God, our love for God, is by the fact that we will obey. It doesn't earn us merit, of course, we understand that. But nonetheless, God is not interested in having a free-for-all. Just, you just, you just call me the saviour and do whatever you like? No, it doesn't work. God wants us with complete trust and submission to him. So um, I've got another hand. I've mentioned before, I'll just uh, touch briefly on some definitions of sin. So one that we uh, generally do tend to pull out is that one on sin is the transgression of the law, which is, which is a fairly broad statement, very clear and concise. If we break God's law, that's sin, simple as that. But here's some other ones. In 1 John 5:17, it says, all unrighteousness is sin. So that broadens it out a bit, doesn't it? And we need to think a bit about, you know, what does unrighteousness mean? But all unrighteousness is sin. Or what about if you show partiality, you commit sin? Now, I thought of this one as we were doing our Sabbath school lesson this morning or today. You know, we are, we are as a people called to reach every nation, kindred, tongue and people, every ethnic group, every socioeconomic group, every age group, every gender group. It doesn't matter. They're all God's children, aren't they? And we are to have no partiality whatsoever, whether over race or socioeconomics or gender, age. None of that prejudice is allowed, is it? It's sin to be partial. And, um, you know, I guess deep down in our hearts, we all have got some hidden prejudices. And we need God to root those out and, and get rid of them, don't we? Because God wants us to love each other, love our enemies. Even our enemies we are to reach out to with love. And uh, only by God's grace is that possible. So God wants us to seek that sort of a, an attitude that Jesus had, the, the attitude that Jesus portrayed. He saw, we learnt in our lesson today, he, he reached out to the rich. He reached out to the poor. He reached out to the lame, the blind and the sick. No one was unimportant. Every single one was important equally to God, wasn't they? Weren't they? And they ought to be to us. And I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. But uh, nonetheless, we need to be reminded at times that, you know, God has uh, given us this challenge to, to love people unconditionally, no matter what their circumstances may be. You know, I guarantee there are people here today who will go home and be lonely tonight and would need love and just understanding and a, and a sympathising ear. I guarantee it. You know, I get like that at times. But thankfully, I've got a family at home that I can talk to. Some don't. And so this is the family that some people rely upon to show sympathy and love and acceptance. That's, that's, that's a part of the law of love, isn't it? And to, not, uh, to, to be partial in any way is, is a sin. Uh, James 4, 17 says, to not do good is sin. So sins of omission, things we ought to do but we don't do. Well, you know, I'm busy, I've got to do this and I've got to do that and I know I should do that but I'm too busy and you know, there's only so many hours in a day and it's such a long drive to get there anyway and you know, visiting someone in the nursing home, a family member who is sitting there lonely for months on end. You know, it's a good thing, isn't it, to go and visit the homeless, the widows, the poor, the fatherless. 
know, that need our care and love. I've got an auntie, the only one left in that generation in our family, quite severely uh, demented in a nursing home. But, you know, when, she, when we go there, she just absolutely loves it. She hasn't got a clue who we are. But <laughs> and we can have a lot of fun with her. And, and, uh, but, you know, it's just our duty, whether they understand it. But she probably forgets five minutes later that we've even been there. But, you know, there's a great blessing in doing something good like that for other people, just because it's good. And there's a, it's actually wrong to not do it. Uh, a proud heart is also sin. And I guess... Um, one of the seven cardinal sin, sins, I think, listed in Proverbs is pride. And uh, that's the human problem, isn't it? Pride. It was Lucifer's problem, that's for sure. And it was certainly Nebuchadnezzar's problem. Is this not great Babylon that I have built? And, uh, you know, we need, to be, uh, we need to be seeking God's help dealing with that uh, proud human heart condition. And then finally, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So unbelief, if you like, is sin. What prevented the children of Israel entering the promised land? Unbelief. What's keeping us here in this old world now? Unbelief. It's not actually reaching out in, in simple childlike faith and accepting what God has promised us. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to His power that works in us. Well, that's humanly impossible. But that's the promise that God makes, isn't it? Do you remember the first day I came to Fountain in the City two years ago? I sang you a song. I won't do it again, I promise, but um, <laughs> Julie just about fell off a seat. Um, but it was that song, I think it's Jude 24 and 5, you know, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless, faultless before his throne with exceeding joy, be glory and majesty, etc., etc. You know, God is a God that is able, isn't he? It says in uh, somewhere in the writings of Ellen White that all of God's biddings are his enablings. Nothing is too hard for God. And it's our unbelief in those promises that's keeping us here today. God is able to teach us to love our enemies, isn't he? If we, if we trust him, that's the promises that one of the promises he makes to us. And once we reach that place where we do genuinely love each other and our enemies, we're going to be ready to go to the kingdom, aren't we? We can't go there while we're still squabbling and backbiting and selfishly looking out for our own interests and not being concerned about the needs of others. Just, just briefly touching back on the uh, issue of the ceremonial law. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, it doesn't matter a hoot. This doesn't matter to God at all. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Not because they earn us some merit or some closer place to Jesus in the kingdom, but because they're there to protect and preserve us from, our, from harming ourselves and each other, isn't it? This is what matters. God wants us to trust him, not on the outward observance of these other things like circumcision and maybe even keeping the Sabbath as some uh, way of thinking we're making God happy by doing so. What matters is keeping the commandments from the heart. Certainly including how they're spelled out. I don't want to diminish that at all. But it needs to come from the heart. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's the test, isn't it? If we truly do love God... Commandment keeping won't be a problem whatsoever. We will be absolutely delighted and looking for ways to please him. And that's, that's, the, that's the experience that God calls us to. Um, you should be familiar with this. I'm just going to quickly flip through this here to finish up. Um, you know, love God with all your heart and soul and mind is the first commandment. The second is like that. Love your neighbour as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. These are the principles that God's laws are if you like, built upon, whether they be civil law, moral law, health law, hygiene laws. At the base of it all is this law to love God supremely, to put God first and foremost in every aspect of our life. And it's easy to stand here and say that, but when we go home and where the rubber meets the road, you know, we'll face challenges. It's not, uh, I'm not saying that this is something we'll just uh, click the finger and it's all going to happen, but God wants us to move in this direction of putting him first and foremost in every aspect of our lives and seeking to love our neighbour as ourselves. I heard it once said that what that means is that we ought to love others as we loved ourselves before we found Jesus. You know, self-love is, to me, one of, the, one of the sins we need to overcome. Now, I mean, that you could, you could open up a whole sermon on that topic, but the point is that um, love for others, love for God is what's the the underlying principles of God's law. That's a very good point because love is made for courage. Love is 
Yeah. So um, I think it says God first, then others, and then, then ourselves, maybe, if we have any love left. Um, I want to just uh, conclude in Galatians chapter 6 and verses 7 to 10. I can see Peter's over there raring to go to come and sing us a beautiful song. Galatians um, chapter 6 and verse 7. It says here, do not be, this is probably finishing on a little bit of a negative note, apologies for that. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to who? To those who are of the household of faith. You know, treat each other nicely, be kind to one another, love one another, and in so doing, we will be bringing honour to God, won't we? And we'll be building a place here that it will be like a, a place of joy and delight, a place where we'll be looking forward to coming every week. And I hope that that will be your experience, that as we grow in our Christian experience, we will want to be here, to be a part of the solution, part, not part of the problem, but part of the solution, loving one another, building each other up, encouraging one another, and uh, as I said, in the process, honouring God. Now, what's that uh, song title there, Hello? You've got uh, switching over to it now. I just want to make a mention of that because uh, Peter did say that. Oh, yeah, so we are challenged with burdens and challenges. This is the song that was challenge us to give them to Jesus Allow him to come. He's the one with the strong arms, isn't he? And let us not try to carry our burdens on our own. Thanks. Are you tired of chasing? Pretty rainbows Are you tired of spinning Round and round Rip up all the shattered Dreams of your life And at the feet of Jesus Lay them down Give them all, give them all, give them all to Jesus. Shed a dreams, wounded heart, broken toys. Give them all, give them all, give them all to Jesus. And he will turn your sorrows into joy. He never said there'd only be sunshine. He never said there'd be no rain. No, no, he only promised a heart full of singing about the very thing that once brought pain. Oh, give them all, give them all, give them all to Jesus. Set a dreams, wounded hearts, broken toys. And he will turn your sorrows into joy. Can you join me sing the chorus one more time? Give them all, give them all, give them all to Jesus. Shed a dream, wounded hearts, broken toys. 
heads for time of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and your kindness and your wisdom in giving us uh, rules, laws, regulations, boundaries that will to constrain us to live in a way that will honour you, that will live in a way that to protect ourselves and each other from harm. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, in your grace and your gentleness, you do not impose these upon us, but you allow us the freedom to choose whether we will allow you to be the Lord of our lives or whether we will choose to sit on the throne of our own hearts. Lord, I pray that each of us here today will realise the value of allowing you to be our King, our Lord and Saviour. And we pray, Lord, that you will give us a trust in you to know what is best and to just submit our lives into your care and keeping and live in a way that will honour you and bring blessing to those uh, in our circle of influence. Lord, we thank you for our church here. I pray for each family, uh, those who are perhaps unwell or discouraged today and can't be with us. And we pray, Lord, that as we enjoy some fellowship outside, that you'll bless our food and our fellowship. May this be a happy time for us all to encourage uh, one another. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer now. And we commit ourselves to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, friends. We'll see you here next week.